Greetings, everyone. This is new to us this afternoon. We're pre-recording this in the front yard of my daughter and son-in-law's home. Uh, we've had a wedding here today. Uh, our grandson Tanner and his fiancee were married this afternoon, and so we decided to pre-record this for showing on the Sunday morning service. And I'd like to thank my other grandson, Landon, Landon Howard, for recording this for us. Uh, he is a professional photographer, and I really appreciate his help. I would like to remind you that the deacons and the people at the church are available. If you need anything, please call the church office at 704-663-2892. And so this being a pre-recorded message, I want to tell you to get your Bibles. And as you get your Bibles, I want you to turn with me, please, to the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I want to talk to you today about bringing giants to their knees. You know, Christianity is not something that we practice on just on Sunday mornings and leave alone for the rest of the time. And if Christianity is work, it must work when times get hard and time gets tough. God allows giants to come into our lives, but when He does, it is for a purpose. We're going to look at the story of David and a giant by the name of Goliath. This is a real story. There were giants in the land, and this story has a profound meaning for each one of us. The Philistines, according to the story, represent the enemies of God in our lives. And such enemies will always be around trying to intrude any way they possibly can. Goliath is the specific giant. Now, you may be saying today, I don't have a giant in my life. And if not, I would remind you there's probably one on the way. Goliath stands for things that invade our lives. It could be a broken relationship. It could be a parenting problem. It could be a sickness problem that you're facing today. It could be broken dreams and dashed plans. Or it could be that your vision is blurred. It could be something that's within your heart. And it could be these troubling times and confusing times of this virus that we're all faced with. And many folks being locked into their homes, something brand new that we've never faced before. So problems and troubles have a way of coming our way and bring us many times to our knees. So let us notice our story, verses 1 through 3, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shokoth. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley Elah, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. Now that tells us that the Philistines were camped in the territory of Judah. You know, Satan has a way of slipping into our lives, and he has no right of being there. So now let's look at the enemy that is described beginning in verse 4. There went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. A one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and he cried unto the armies of Israel. And he said to them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine and you are servants of Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. There's one thing to note. Goliath is one big man. He is a giant. And any time Satan can get his foot in the door, he strips down our confidence. Because in those verses 8, beginning in 8 through verse 10, Goliath issues his challenge to the people. And as he issues this challenge, here's what the scriptures tell us. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day, Give me a man that we might fight together. Now you'll notice 
uh, David appears on the scene. Now Goliath had been bullying this army for 40 days. But in verse 23, there was a man who heard God, and that was David. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and he spake according to the same words, and David heard them. Now, David goes on to say also that nothing is impossible with God. Now, if you and I are going to bring giants to their knees in our lives, there are several things. Number one, God must be real. Do you believe that today? He is. David was saying, what right does this giant have coming in here among the people of God? David knew that God was alive. Now, if we're to make a difference for God, then we must know that we serve a God that's alive. Do you remember the story of Elisha and his servant? Uh, they had been out serving and working, and it came a time of rest. And uh, Elisha and his servant entered into the door of their tent, went down to sleep, and all of a sudden his servant looked out the door of the tent and he says, Look around us, there's a great Syrian army. Elisha, wake up. What is it? What is it? Look around. And uh, Elisha said, Look, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And when he looked out again, all he saw were angels and chariots of fire. Aren't you glad today that you serve a living God? Why did Noah build an ark? Why did Moses lead the children of, out of bondage? Why did Gideon go to war with 300 men? They believed that they served a real God. And the real God that they served was with them and would protect them. Folks, it's going to make a difference when God is real in your life and mine. The second thing in verses 32 through 37, God is not only real, but He is reliable. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go out and fight this Philistine. Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight him, for thou art but a youth. He's just a teenager, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said to Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth, and when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. He hath defiled the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Now, he is reliable. Goliath, he says, is just like any other animal. Hey, I faced a bear. I faced a lion. God delivered me, and I can face Goliath. Do you have any remembrance in your heart and in your mind when God was reliable to you? He has been faithful in the past. He is faithful today, and he will be faithful tomorrow. Now, if you need encouragement, think of Moses when he said to Pharaoh, let my people go. When he said to Daniel, when Daniel opened his window to pray, and he just kept on praying and God cared for him. When Elijah met the false prophets on the mountaintop and the fire of God fell, and Elijah and God's people were the winners. Just think of the times that God has provided for you when you're about ready to quit. We must not only believe that God is real, and that God is reliable, but we almost must trust God's resources, beginning in verse 38. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also, he armed him with a coat of mail. David girded his sword upon his arm, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. You know, these resources, this is a great story. Saul was a big man himself. And so he says to David, here, take my armor. 
So David puts it on. I could just picture this. He takes a step or two and he finds out that that suit that he's put on is probably a 52 long. He can spin around in it. It's too big for him. So he takes it off and he says, Saul, I can't wear all of this stuff. God is going to supply my needs. Now, this is an area of our lives where we are continually defeated. We try everything we can to get our problem solved. And then we wonder, can God help? Why did we come to the Lord in the first place? Why does God allow giants to come in our lives? So that we will learn not to trust in ourselves, but we will trust Him. I do not know what many of you today that are watching this broadcast are facing right now. But I know the giant is there by God's permission. And whatever that giant is, God is greater. And God has a great plan, folks. And I want you to look at verse 40 with me, please, as we continue with the story. David took his staff in his hand, chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So he gets all of the stuff together. David, David and Goliath sort of spar around, and then David issues his final words to Goliath. He tells him these words, beginning in verse 45. David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will smite you and take your head from you. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beast of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And shall all this assembly know that the Lord saveth not with a sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. It came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him, cut off his head wherewith, and when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until they come to the valley, to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way of Sherem, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines and they spoiled their tents." See, David knew that God had a plan. And David knew that God's power was not in the spear. It wasn't in the sword. It wasn't in the big staff. When we learn that our power is not in how many seminars we go to or how many workshops we attend, when we realize that the power of God is all we need, and if that is not, we're not going to get the job done. Now we know God is real, He's reliable, and we're depending on His resources. But folks, lastly, we had better make sure <clears throat> that we are the representatives of God. You know, there are some things that God may want done, but not necessarily by me or by you. Because there's no way that I as an individual or you as an individual can do everything. Whatever we do, we had better know that God wants us to do it. Did David believe that he was God's choice? Well, if you look at verses 48 and 49 that we read, you'll notice that David believed that he was God's man. He was really depending on God's power, and he took the challenge from God. When you know that God has chosen you to do a certain task, you aren't afraid. Whatever that obstacle might be in your way, it will move over with the power of God. When that stone hit Goliath in the head, his last thought probably was, this can't be happening to me. Well, that's just a teenage boy 
what in the world is happening. David believed, David acted, and he expected God to work. You see, faith is not passive. It is active. Somebody asked, why did, why did David choose five stones? Now, I've heard some folks say that uh, Goliath had five brothers, and he did. But I want to offer this suggestion to you this morning. David knew that God was going to give the victory. But he didn't know how long it's going to take. He didn't know how many stones it's going to take. So he was prepared to stay until the battle was over. He picked up five smooth stones, put them in his little satchel, put one in his slingshot, and one was all it took. You know, too many times we are one stone Christians. We throw one stone and if the giant in our lives does not go down, we are prone to say, God, I did my part. You didn't do yours. And God has a way of saying, keep on throwing the rocks and I'll bring down the giant in your life in my own time. The Lord's battle may be longer than we thought. It may be tougher than we thought. It may be harder than we thought. But if we remain faithful, the giant will be brought to its knees. And when we're asked about the victory, we can say it was Christ in me, the hope of glory. I wonder today, as we come to the close of the message, are you in a battle? What is it that is going on in your life? Some sickness, some problem that you're thinking is just absolutely too big to face? What is it? Well, don't run, don't quit. Keep on keeping on because in God's time, the giant in your life is going to fall and you're going to get the victory. Your responsibility is simply to trust in God. This morning, earlier, when we were thinking about the message for this afternoon that I was going to pre-record, these thoughts came to mind. And it's something that each one of us need to be thinking about. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost. Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly, and you will be singing as the days go by. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged. God is over all. Count your many blessings. Angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Again, let me remind you this, this day that if you have an emergency, if you have a problem, please call the church office. Uh, let your deacon know. And if you need to talk with me, the secretary has my phone number. All she has to do is let you know and you can call me anytime. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this day. We thank you for this new way of getting the message out to the people of the church and others who will be viewing this live stream. We give you thanks for this te technology that makes it possible. We want to thank you too for your love and your grace. Thank you for your protection and care during this time of crisis in our country, even in our state and our counties. We pray for those today that have been affected by this virus. We pray for those families that have lost loved ones, and we pray that you will be with them. Now, Lord, we pray that you will guide and direct, help each one to have a good afternoon, and allow your blessings to reign in their lives as they trust in you. For it's in Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen.